For years I've hunted ghosts. I've learned their habits, their ways, and their secrets. I've seen a lot of strange things over the years, but nothing could prepare me for what I saw in the West Virginia woods last week. We'll tell you all about it in this episode of The Ghost Hunter Finder Guys. Finder guys. Tonight we've got a special episode. We're going to talk about this brand new footage fresh out of the mountains of West Virginia. Rather than describe it, we'll just get right to it. Roll the tape! That's right! Bigfoot! We finally captured proof of the existence of Bigfoot, dudes! It's not what we were after at the time, but this may be the most important find in the whole history of the Ghost Hunter Finder guys. Tonight, we'll bring you a team of experts from around the world to tell us all about the... Good evening and welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, the place where America comes to watch a talking cat review horror movies. Tonight we have something special. We're going to talk about one of my all-time favorite found footage movies. It's one you probably haven't seen, but I recommend it highly. But first, we're going to check in with our friend Crimson Meerkat to find out the latest about his search for Malcolm Fluffosaurus and all of the events from the last episode. At least we were going to check in with him, but Meerkat still hasn't checked in with us and we don't know where he is. So we're going to fill the dead air by talking to Chip. For those who are new to the show, Chip is a beer enthusiast who also has a show on PBDC TV called The Ghost Hunter Finder Guys. Apparently Chip got into a little bit of controversy this week and he's here to tell us all about it. Good evening, Chip. Don't you good evening me, dude. I know you're the one behind all of this. I see. Well, maybe you could help the audience out by telling them what it is I'm supposed to have done to you. You got my show pulled off the air, dude. And why would I do something like that? Well, you know, scratch that. Why don't you back up a little and tell us what happened first? Well, my crew and I were out in the woods in West Virginia shooting some B-roll for an upcoming episode when suddenly we see something moving in the woods. So I turned on my camera and got the best ever footage of Bigfoot. It was perfect, dude. And then you had it taken off the air. I'm impressed that you think I have that kind of power. Don't deny it, dude. We set up a special live episode to show the footage to a bunch of Bigfoot experts, and you had it taken off the air. It was going to be our biggest ratings ever. You got jealous and had PBDC TV taken off the air. Chip, listen. That show where Akia talks to clowns already gets way more views than I do. I'm used to having lower ratings than everybody else. I've talked to Penelope over at PBDC TV headquarters about this, and it turns out they stopped your broadcast for legal reasons. What kind of legal reasons? Well, apparently we received a cease and desist letter from Bigfoot's attorney. Wait, what? Bigfoot has an attorney? Oh yeah, he's very litigious. That's why you never see video or pictures of him. It's not because people can't find him, it's because he threatens to take them to court. Apparently there's some sort of language in the Endangered Species Act that they're able to use against paparazzi. Dude, I had no idea. But what about all of those Bigfoot Hunter shows on TV? Those are every bit as fake as your ghost hunting show. Dude, my show's not fake, dude. We've seen real ghosts. One of them stole away my girlfriend Vanessa, and I've been alone ever since. Yes, of course. That's totally because of ghosts. 
Didn't she friendzone you on live television last season? I don't want to talk about it. So your video of Bigfoot isn't new or revolutionary. Basically, you caught a glimpse of a reclusive celebrity while he was walking across the yard to check his mail. Everything I've ever believed in the world is a lie. Oh, hey now, don't be like that. It could happen to anyone. I'm sure you'll be back and pretending to hunt ghosts again real soon. But I borrowed money to pay the Bigfoot experts that were going to appear on the show. I can't get that back. Now I can't repay it. Those dudes are going to break my legs, dude. Yeah, but that's next week's problem. So, on another subject, have you seen Crimson Meerkat since last episode? No, dude. When Herbert the Cave Monster showed up, the monkey dude took off into the cave running and screaming. I haven't seen him since. Well, if you see him, tell him he needs to get in touch with us. He owes me a show segment, and I'm running out of material to fill the dead air. Pretty soon, I'm going to have to have Edgar do another segment of Monster Chat, and nobody wants that. Yeah, I'll let him know, dude. I'm going to go out of town now and lay low for a while until I figure out how to pay back the mob. Talk to you later, dude. So now Chip owes money to the mob. Well, that can't be good. But now that we've given the latecomers a chance to join the live watch party, it's time to get down to the business of horror movies. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad that you're here. Now pour yourself a drink and relax, because here we go. This is the story of Peeping Tom and how I went looking for him. He found this box, a uh, full lot of tapes. It has become home to Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom. The Blink Man. Mr. Blink. Now, he's a class of supernatural creature called a Flimmengeist. German alchemists came up with this term in the 1500s for that thing, that thing that you see in the corner of your eyes. And when you look around to, to see it, there's nothing there. Well, of course there's no record of it. People are too busy dying to report it. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be alive, so I ask whoever find this, please apply the first and second halves of this final interview to the beginning and end of my film. We're in this business because we like to entertain, but we're in this business because we want to make money, okay? And if you can do this without blinking, a peeping Tom comes out of the shadows and materializes in front of you. Hey, Gavin. Gavin. Play. Got it. And press pause. Pause, pause. Bingo. Oh, right there, right there, right there. Yeah. Oh my gosh, dude, it's fucking Blink Man. The twist is that um, once you've seen him, you can't unsee him. Uh, every time you blink, he's a little bit closer. He keeps on getting closer, and that's where he needs to stay. Well, he sounds scary. What does he do? Get you. Get you. I don't know how much longer I can go without blinking. It's time for our featured film review for the evening. Tonight we are going to talk about one of my favorites, a film called Butterfly Kisses. Specifically, I watched the 4K version of this film on Amazon Prime for this review. Butterfly Kisses is a found footage horror mockumentary. It was released in the year 2018, so it's a fairly recent film. It was directed by Eric Christopher Myers, and the cast includes Rachel Armiger, Reed Delisle, and Matt Lake. Now, you've probably never heard of any of those people, as we have talked about many times on this show. Found footage movies often have casts of people that you have not heard of. Not only is that because they're often independent films, low budget with new actors, it helps you to get into the feel of the film if uh, you don't recognize any of the actors and actresses in the film. So let's get into setting your expectations for this film. If you're going to sit down and watch Butterfly Kisses, what you should expect is an intelligent, interesting found footage horror mockumentary with a very investigative feel. Now I like this film a lot and we're going to talk about that investigative feel more as we go along in this review. If you like The Blair Witch Project, you'll probably like Butterfly Kisses. Uh, it's a well done found footage mockumentary. It doesn't remind me so much of The Blair Witch Project itself as it does 
There was a mockumentary that went along with the Blair Witch Project about the history of the Blair Witch and the discovery of the footage. If you enjoyed that, you'll really enjoy Butterfly Kisses. Now, if you're going to sit down to watch Butterfly Kisses, we're going to help you set your sights. This is the scale we like to use. On the far left side of the scale, we have very campy films such as The Silence. Excuse me. We have very campy films such as Jason X. On the far right side of the scale, we have very serious films such as The Silence of the Lambs. Boy, that was almost a major mistake. Anyway, as we have often said, this scale is not an indicator of the quality of the film. It's an indicator of what your mindset needs to be going into a film in order to maximize your enjoyment. So basically this tells you, should I go in expecting a comedy? Should I go in expecting something dark and gritty? Should I expect something in between? Butterfly Kisses is pretty far to the right. It is a serious film. Now, the premise of the film is obviously fantastical, involving a Flemingeist or a Blink Ghost. But beyond that, it is played straight as a serious film. There's really not any comedy or comic relief in this film. So let's get into a film summary. In this film, in 2015, filmmaker Gavin York hires a documentary film crew to follow him and document his progress as he attempts to turn a box of found video cassettes into a found footage film. So it's kind of three layers deep. You're not watching Gavin York put his, you're not watching Gavin York's film. You are watching a documentary of Gavin York putting his film together, which actually makes the film flow better for reasons that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The videotapes tell the story of film students Sophia and Feldman and their effort to document the legend of Peeping Tom, a supernatural entity said to haunt a local train tunnel. So as I just mentioned, this film is three layers deep. On the found footage cassettes, you have Sophia and Feldman attempting to make a documentary about Peeping Tom. At the next level up, you have Gavin York trying to finish their documentary. And the third level, you have the documentary film crew following Gavin York putting this film together. What this does is it lets you see over and over again the effects of obsession and how Peeping Tom comes to haunt all the people involved in the, in the films. Now, the legend of Peeping Tom says that if you can stare down the train tunnel at midnight without blinking for an hour, Peeping Tom will appear before you. Now, the train tunnel used in this film is real. It is the Ilchester train tunnel located in Ilchester, Maryland, not too far from Steve the Cat headquarters. The legend of Peeping Tom is not real, but the train tunnel is real, and it is kind of spooky. Unfortunately, if you stare down the train tunnel for, mid for an hour at midnight without blinking and Peeping Tom appears to you, once this happens, he becomes affixed to you and he gets closer every time you blink. That brings us to our villain profile for this film. Our villain is Peeping Tom. Here you see kind of a sketch of Peeping Tom. He is a shadowy figure that appears throughout the film. He belongs to the class known as Flimmengeist, that is German meaning blink ghost, referring to kind of the, uh, the black figures that appear in the corner of your eye and then when you try to look at them dead on, they're gone. Um, not that different from a shadow person in that respect at least, uh, not like a shadow person in terms of what they are supposed to represent, but both of them being black figures that show up kind of at the periphery of your vision. Peeping Tom's special powers, uh, well, he has no physical form, but he imprints himself on you such that you see him get closer every time you blink. And as far as a signature weapon or signature technique, it is unclear exactly how Peeping Tom kills his victims, though it sometimes appears that the victim was frightened to death. And now a word from our benevolent overlords at PBDC-TV your nightly heartbeat of horror.
So let's talk about the things I liked about this film. And uh, if you have not gotten the impression already, I do like this film a lot. So let's talk about the things I like about this film. Off the bat, the concept and the story are original and interesting. So many horror movies are formulaic. This one's actually more original and it's very interesting. The film has the feel of an investigative documentary with some scary moments throughout as opposed to a found footage horror film explicitly designed to frighten the audience. So it's not the kind of found footage film where you have cameras bouncing around in the dark, giving you jump scares as they suddenly settle on something scary. It's more of a documentary, but it is very well done. If you enjoy true crime documentaries, you'll probably enjoy Butterfly Kisses. I found myself getting immersed in the story and wondering what would happen next. That's why I liked this film so much. I just completely got immersed in the story. And by giving us a documentary about a filmmaker assembling another filmmaker's project, the story has three layers and we get to see concepts like a filmmaker's obsession played out several different ways. Now, there are some things that could have been better about this film, although, as I've said, I recommend this film and I like it a lot. Right off the top, this is more of a mockumentary with some scary moments rather than a straight-up horror film. So if you're looking for body count, uh, if you're looking for blood and gore, this is not the film for you. If you're looking for intelligent, found footage mockumentary, something that's almost more psychological than, and, than supernatural, this is a good film. At the end of the day, there just aren't that many scares in the film. And this gets back to what I mentioned, that it's more of a mockumentary with some scary moments than a horror mockumentary. The acting is mediocre. It's not bad, but it's nothing special either. It's good enough that it won't distract you from the film, but it's not really going to take you away to Oscar land either. Some of the characters are unlikable, although that is intentional. So you have some intentionally unlikable characters in this film. And there is no real resolution at the end of the film. It's kind of like the end of the story is that there is no end to the story. So some of you might find that disappointing. If you're the kind of person who needs something wrapped up in a neat tiny package at the end of the film, you might be dissatisfied. So let's get to Steve's scorecard for this film. Now this is a different kind of film, so the scorecard is not going to be as high as we normally see on this show. Kills, I counted two. Bare breasts, drum roll please. None, counted none, it is not that kind of film. Once again, not that kind of film. Dean Nogginings, how many characters lose their melon? None. Jump scares. I counted two good jump scares. Uh, I guess it depends upon your tolerance to jump scares. You might consider the film having more if you're um, more likely to jump uh, based upon something scary happen on the screen or something suddenly coming out to you on the screen. Eyelid slicing. I counted two. And douche nozzle husbands. Oh yes, we have one and he is a gigantic douche nozzle. But with your viewing of Butterfly Kisses, you also get some bonus features, such as Gavin's terrifying douchey cap. Yes, Gavin York wears a cap throughout this film, and it will make you want to punch him right in the face. You get a box that literally says, don't watch. Yes, the tapes that Gavin finds are in a box that is literally labeled, don't watch. Now, you can kind of say that's like putting a, re a, a sign in front of a big red button that says, please don't push the big red button, and uh, just the temptation's going to make you want to, but in fairness, the box did say, don't watch. You get a tape labeled Final Solution, which I found kind of an unfortunate use of terms. I'm a real filmmaker. I don't make horror movies. That's the closest thing to a joke in the film, the fact that these people making a found footage mockumentary of, of a horror story say, I'm a real filmmaker, I don't make horror movies. It's like the tunnel is staring back at me. The tunnel is very eerie. You get Eduardo Sanchez action. Yes, the father of found footage films, the director of the Blair Witch Project does have a appearance in this film, at least a voice appearance in this film. 
you get savings stealing action and uh, to be more right on the nose with that what do I mean by saving stealing action yes Gavin literally robbed his own son so as I mentioned there are some intentionally unlikable people in this film and uh, Gavin literally robs his own son at one point in this film to give you an idea of how that's gonna go you get the viral spread of obsession so as I mentioned you get to see how obsession with the legend of peeping Tom first affected Sophia and Feldman and then affects Gavin and then affects the film crew that are documenting Gavin so obsession spreads kind of like a virus in this film so let's get to Steve's final score I'm going to give this one three and a half paws out of four I really like this film I watch it a couple of times a year I really enjoy it I like this film so much that we've talked about it on this show now three different times we've twice talked about this uh, very briefly in the other stuff Steve watched this week segment we're finally getting around to doing a featured film review of it it is a well-made and interesting found footage documentary that feels more like an investigation of a local legend than a straight-up horror film so you've got to be in the right mindset for this as I said if you're looking for body count if you're looking for blood and gore this is not the film for you but if you're looking for something that's more intellectual more of a slow burn feels almost like a true crime documentary with a few scares thrown in here and there you'll really enjoy this it's a very well done film anyway that is butterfly kisses and that is our featured film review for this week we've reached the end of another episode of spooky tales with steve the cat but before we go as is our tradition we're going to take just a moment to talk about some of the other stuff i watched this week tonight we're going to talk about this film called orphan first kill i found this movie on amazon prime orphan first kill is a 2022 american horror film so it is a very recent film but it's one i wanted to see so i've gone ahead and reviewed it even though I don't normally do recent films on this show note that this is a prequel to a 2009 film called Orphan in this film we learned the story of Lena Lena is an unusual patient in an Estonian psychiatric hospital and what makes her so unusual is that Lena suffers from a rare physical condition that gives her the appearance of a 10 year old even though she actually is 31 years old now in addition to this Lena also is very dangerous as we learn when she escapes from the clinic by killing one of the guards and later one of the clinic's therapists so now Lena has escaped and is on the run so once free Lena looks up information on missing girls and notes that she bears a strong resemblance to Esther an American girl that has been missing for four years so she turns herself into the police as Esther Posing as Esther, Lena is reunited with her family in Connecticut, but all is not as it seems, and we're kind of off to the races from there. So what did I think of this film? I enjoyed this film, and I do recommend it. Uh, overall, it's a psychological horror film with moments of over-the-top slasher film violence. It's well-written, it is well-acted, it has excellent production values, and it uses clever practical special effects to create the childlike appearance of Esther. So instead of using CGI to de-age the actress, they do a combination of makeup effects and uh, trick camera shots to give her the appearance of being much younger than she really is. Now on the pro side, the story for this film is very interesting and as a bonus, it takes a twist that I was not expecting. Now on the downside, once you get past that initial twist, uh, it's a little bit predictable. Now we talk about this time and time again. Horror movies are predictable by their nature, so this one's no worse than any other. And it does have an interesting twist that at least I was not expecting, but once you get past that, uh, it's not too difficult to see where it's going to end up. So overall, I recommend this film. It can be watched as a standalone film. In fact, I have either not seen Orphan or not seen it recently enough to remember much about it. Um, so I was able to watch Orphan First Kill without having seen the um, predecessor movie and uh, was able to follow along perfectly. So recommend this one as a standalone film. It's available on Amazon Prime. Uh, there's some good stuff on Amazon Prime right now. Orphan First Kill is available and The Black Phone is available. So recommend this film. That's Amazon Prime, that's Orphan First Kill, and that is our recommendation for what we watched this week.
Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad you're here. If you did enjoy the show, then please check us out on social media. You can find Steve the Cat on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So please stop by and hit that subscribe button. And of course, Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat is available exclusively through the PBDC Collective Incorporated. Now legally incorporated, but still your heartbeat of horror. You can find us on the web at psychobunnydc.com, or you can check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Rumble, and Discord. Note that the Discord site is for members only, so if you're interested, please go to psychobunnydc.com and click the link for an invitation, and we'll get you all set up. Next episode, we're going to talk about a surprisingly good supernatural horror movie that I found on Netflix of all places. Yes, Netflix, not normally known for its collection of horror movies, but I found one worth watching. It's sure to be a lot of fun, so make sure to join us on Monday nights at 10 p.m. And just as a side note, we're now on every other week, alternating Monday nights with Ghoul Radio. So join us next week for Ghoul Radio, and we'll be back with a new episode of Spooky Tales the following week. That's all for now, so until next time, thank you for joining us, and have a great week.